So today, we are rounding off the chapter in Acts, Acts chapter 17, and I have four points for Acts 17, 16 through 34. Our first point is, we should expect that the message of Jesus' resurrection will seem new to a world full of idol worship and be encouraged to tell everyone about the gospel that saves. We should expect that the message of Jesus' resurrection will seem new to a world full of idol worship and be encouraged to tell everyone about the gospel that saves. Now this is taken from verses 16 through 21. Please read with me. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshiped God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him. Some said, what is this ignorant show off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, may we learn about this new teaching you are presenting? Because what you say sounds strange to us and we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. This is the word of the Lord. Now here in the second half of Acts 17, Paul is in Athens awaiting Silas and Timothy after being chased out of Berea for preaching the word of God. Paul's spirit was provoked, distressed, as he observed that Athens was a city filled with idols. And the Athenians worshipped these idols religiously. Being compelled by the spirit and distress of the mass idolatry in this city, Paul began to persuade the Jews in the synagogue, those who worshipped God and also people in the marketplace, about the gospel. Paul went to everyone to share the gospel. Detailed in verse 18 are two types of philosophers that began to debate with Paul about the gospel, opposing the gospel. They were leading scholars of the city. The opponents were intrigued by Paul's message of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. It was something new. But why was it something new? The Epicureans, they were people who pursued pleasure as the chief purpose in life and valued most of all a peaceful life free from pain. The Stoics, they taught about materialism, that all of creation is made of material things, including God, logos, and human souls, which are made of fire. It must have seemed new because Paul preached about Jesus and his resurrection. This was foreign to them. This was new to these leading scholars, that God came down into the world, became flesh, and died for our sins, and then was resurrected. These idol worshipers found that message to be shocking. The gospel that Paul was sharing tells of God who lives, and whom is able to impart to us who believe the same death and resurrection. This was shocking to the Athenian scholars because in most cases of their idol worship and religious and religions, their gods would simply kill them for disobedience. Their idea of God was not one who is alive or able to have a living relationship with his creation. Their gods were stationary statues that were dead. These curious idol worshipers then brought Paul to the Areopagus a meeting place of intellectual rulers of Athens, eager to hear of this new teaching. Does Athens sound familiar to you, brothers and sisters? It should. Our own cities, Honolulu, Sydney, sometimes our homes, even in the churches, 
are filled with idol worship. We can see it in our cities how they praise sports, NFL in America, rugby over here. They praise those who are famous, those who are wealthy, the pagans. They idolize sexual immorality. How about in our homes? Marriages can be idolized. Children, work. In churches, are we idolizing the pastor, religious works, or competitiveness with children? Believers must be cautious not to fall into idol worship. We must pray that God will transform our hearts to worship him and not the idols in our lives to change us. Be aware that this gospel will seem new to idol worshipers. For example, a man who is always working and sets no time for worship is one who worships wealth over Christ. When evangelized too, he might say he thought that as a man he's supposed to provide for his family, but idolizing his job and wealth has led him away from worshiping God, from depending on God to provide for our needs instead of being greedy and wanting more. The gospel will seem new to those who aren't changed and transformed by Christ. In the church, wearing head covering will seem new to an unbelieving woman. Even when confronted with what scripture teaches, many women will turn away because of worshiping self instead of submitting to God's order of creation. Again, the gospel will be new to those who aren't changed by the gospel, who don't know Christ. And here the gospel of Jesus Christ compels us to evangelize. Believers should be moved by the state of our cities and its idol worship to go, to warn, to lovingly warn about the good news about our Lord Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead and is able to save us from eternal death. And we need not to worry about opposition because the message of Christ's resurrection will seem new to those who worship idols. But we stand firm proclaiming that Jesus saves. He transforms our hearts. That's where our worship belongs, in Christ. Please join me with reading Mark chapter 1, verse 27 through 28. They were all amazed, and so they began to ask each other, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, the news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Coming now to our second point, which is taken from verses 22 to 25. The gospel that saves proclaims a living God that is worthy of our worship. Taken from verses 22 to 25, please join me. Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by hands, Neither is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. This is the word of the Lord. Here Paul is brought to the Areopagus. It was a meeting center for all the political and scholar leaders in Athens. Here Paul proclaims the living God versus the false dead gods of Athens. That what, you, that what use is there for worshiping dead gods? Only dead gods are confined to sanctuaries built by hands. Only a dead god needs human service. Paul declares that our God is living. That our God is not confined to an altar built by hands. That our God does not need our service. But in his sovereignty provides life and gives everyone life and breath and all things. The living God is who we should be worshiping. 
What does your false idols do for your salvation? Does fame and sports lead you to being saved? Does wealth promise salvation after you die? Can your husband or wife give you everlasting peace? Can your job save you from suffering? If not, then why are we worshiping these idols? We should be worshiping God, the living God. God that provides us with peace. God that does not need our works to be pleased. God that cares for us and hears our prayers. God that gives us rest. God that has made us a temple living inside of us, transforming and changing our hardened hearts. The living God is whom we should be worshiping. Please join me in reading Psalms 50, verse 10 through 11. For every animal of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountains, and everything that moves in the field is mine. This is but a glimpse of who the living God is. He is all-knowing. He is alive. He takes our burdens away and is worthy of our worship. Any false idol is dead, and there is no sense in worshiping what is dead. This brings us to our third point, which is taken from verses 26 to 31, is that the gospel of the living God calls everyone to repent and submit, for judgment is surely coming on the world through Christ. Please join me. From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might see God, and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Since then we are God's offspring. We shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Paul details further the nature of God, that God created man and from that one man came the rest of mankind. Verse 27 tells us that God did this so that his creation would reach out and want to know him. And he is not far from us. We are made his children, and so to be God's children, we shouldn't think that our great God could be confined to material things such as metal or stone idols. Rather, the living God calls us to repent to turn away from idol worship, to turn away from worshiping dead gods, because there is indeed judgment that is coming through our Lord Jesus Christ, and those who haven't repented will face that judgment. Brothers and sisters, we are called to repent. I urge you to be concerned, and I warn you that if you have teachers in your classrooms, in your homes or even in the church that are not preaching or teaching repentance, I urge you to leave. Verse 30 to 31 confirms that judgment is coming for the unrepented. Repent from idol worship of wealth, sex, and pride. Repent from falling away because of self-righteousness and rebellion. Look what's happening in the United Church, in the United Methodist Church in America. This message of acceptance with the endorsing of homosexual union. You see, when one sin is declared okay, that leaves the door open for all other sins to be okay. That is the teaching of unrepentance. And that, my brothers and sisters, is outside of the, repent of the repentance that God calls us to. Turn away from such teachings, for indeed there is judgment coming. For just as Christ was risen, indeed there is a set day 
where he will judge the whole world. We are called to submit to God, to reach out to him, for he is close to us, and to repent. Please read with me Luke chapter 24, verse 45 to 47. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, So it is written that Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. This brings us to our last point. The gospel of the living God will either soften or harden the hearts of those who hear it. That's taken from verses 32 to 34. Please join me. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him. But others said, we'd like to hear from you again about this. So Paul left their presence. However, some people joined him and believed, including Dionysius, an Aparagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. This is the word of the Lord. See, here at the end of Acts 17, we see what the gospel does to those who hear it. Some people's hearts were hardened, and they didn't believe, and even mocked God. But some listened. Their hearts were softened, and they believed. Brothers and sisters, what are you? Are you someone whose heart has been softened by the gospel? Or are you someone whose heart is hardened? Believing means repenting from your sins. And there is a clear change in your life. Conviction. And you are no longer enslaved to the sins that rule over you. Unbelieving means you still live in your sin. Unrepenting. And there's no change or conviction in your hearts. There are many in the church today who just come to hear the gospel. But when they leave, they continue to live in their sin. There is no change. We must pray that Christ soften our hearts and causes us to repent, to live anew, to live in worship of the living God and not the false dead gods. Amen.